Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Fantasy Football Profits. Today we're going to go over our tight end rankings. Of course, we've already done a first tight end rankings video, but we're going to do another just update some things. Um, this year's actually been, there hasn't been a whole lot of changes, uh, but we have learned a few more things. We have updated some things, and so we're going to go over that again. And of course, for anyone who hasn't seen our first video, um, we're going to go through a really important thing that we're going to talk about is our tiers. Um, and we're all kind of going to vary a little bit and just talk about that. This might be a bit more of a casual video. So leave a comment down below if you think uh, you don't like the structure of this video or how we do it. But um, as always, I tell people to go check our Facebook, check our website for our rankings, especially on tight ends. It's got them all ordered. Um, and then all of our notes and stats from last year. Uh, Rob, what do you guys have to say before we start? Well, you know, this is our second video, like you said. Things have changed, although they're going to change drastically more. Camps are just starting to begin. Preseason is really starting to kick off at this point. And so now you're going to hear a lot more information coming up. But we wanted to update you guys a little bit. I know some of you that are pretty radical out there are beginning to have drafts. Uh, for me, that's a bit premature. I like to do my draft closer to the end of August, even early September if I can. But for those out there, uh, we want to update this video. But watch our website, watch uh, Facebook, different things like that, Instagram. And as these things continue to change, will continue to give you new information. Anything you want to add to that, Ryan? Uh, no, I'm ready to just get working. Okay. All right, let's go for it. All right, so now we're going to get into our first tier one, and this is a interesting one as far as I think we all pretty much know. It's a pretty simple one. Um, what do you guys think? Who do you have number one? I don't know. I have Rob Gronkowski number one, but I'll clarify. It's a little bit more confusing than just one and two for me. What do you guys think? Well, you know, first of all, I've got uh, three guys in my tier one, and I've got Robin Gronkowski, number one, although there's some room for flexibility there. But I'll say this. We look at tier one. You're talking about tight ends that you can trust. These guys are going to produce. And if I'm in a league where I have to start a tight end, I'm going to try really, really hard to lock one of these guys down because I don't want to get stuck playing week to week or get stuck with uh, an average tight end at best. These guys are the studs that you can depend on. That Before I get into some details why I have Rob Gronkowski, number one, uh, anything you want to say there, Ryan? Um, no, I agree. I have Rob Gronkowski. Uh, Rob Gronkowski number one as well. Um, my tiers basically comes down to the way the way everyone's drafting them. There's one or two guys right at the top. There's another guy right in that top three tier. Um, sorry, top three of that tier. So um, what it comes down to is when you look at it, he's the only guy I could put number one. I'm dying right now. I don't know what I was gonna say. I'm sorry. That's all right. You know, you know, I look at Rob Gronkowski, and I think. Uh, you know, what are the concerns? The guy's been around quite a while. He's 29 years old, which in uh, football terms is getting older. And it's easy to want to look at somebody else. But for me, Gronkowski, it comes down to staying healthy. Obviously, that's been an issue for him. And he has missed a lot of games, obviously, the last four or five years. But for me, hands down, when he's on the field and when he's healthy, he's still the best tight end in football right now. Now, when it's all said and done, he may not have the statistic, let's say, that Tony Gonzalez is going to have, simply because I don't think that he's going to play that many total games. Uh, he's injured a lot. He plays very physical, but it's also that same physical play that makes him such a dominant force. And he's so physical, he creates so many mismatches for safeties, linebackers, corners. No matter you put on, if you put a linebacker on the guy, he's so quick out there. He's got speed. If you put him on a, a safety or cornerback, he's so big and physical. But I want to just throw a stat out there, and I want to hear your guys' thoughts on it. But um, when you consider how good this guy is, if you look at his per-game statistics over 16 games, he averages over 16 games in his career. 74 catches, 1,126 yards, and 12 TDs. I mean, that's great stats. Now let's compare that to other Hall of Famers like Tony Gonzalez, Shannon Sharp, Antonio Gates, and Kellen Winslow, who, by the way, were great tight ends themselves. Those guys, statistical averages per game over 16 games, uh, Tony Gonzalez averages 78 catches, 894 yards, 7 TDs. Shannon Sharp, 64 catches, 789 yards, and 5 TDs. Antonio Gates, 67 catches, 837 yards and 8 TDs with Kellen Winslow coming in at 79 catches, 999 yards and 7 TDs. Once again, you go back to Gronkowski, who over 16 <clears throat> game averages 74 catches, 1,126 yards and 12 TDs. When he's healthy, when he's on the field, he produces better than any tight end that's ever played the game, in my opinion. What do you guys think, Christian? Yeah, you know, I completely agree with that, and there's a reason. Like I said, I have him number one in my rankings. I think he is, hands down, the best, most talented tight end in the NFL right now. Like you said, over 16 games, he's averaging 12 touchdowns. You're not going to get that production from any other tight end. The problem is, because of that talent, I have to put him number one. I don't think there's any arguing him in any other spot than number one. But... Over the last like five seasons, he's only averaged playing 11.6 games per season, which makes me think, well, I'm only going to get him for 11 and a half games. I just can't draft him at number one. He's the most talented, but it's too big of a risk. And so for me, I much more want to target Zach Ertz or Travis Kelsey, who I agree with you, are in my tier one. 
Um, but I think in my mind, that's undeniable. His production is hands down better than everybody else. And I think that's the only reason why I considered moving Gronk down is based on the fact alone that, like you said, 11.6 games over the past few seasons on average, he's going to miss some time. If he does, if he can't stay healthy, what are you going to do? Are you gonna pop, who are you going to pop in there to stream at tight end? And this tier one is the tier where, like you said, these are the guys you want to pick them up, draft them, set it and forget it. You only want to take them out during the bye week and have to worry about that. So um, if you're worrying about injuries every week, you know, if he's on the injury list and you don't know if he's going to start, that's just another bench slot that you could have to take up by, you know, grabbing another tight end just in case he might not play. So um, as long as he's in, as long as he's playing, I guarantee that he will be at least in that top five category. And they have a pretty, pretty easy schedule this year when it comes to tight ends. Um, currently against the defenses, they're ranking second for overall versus um, their defenses. So he has the second easiest schedule of all tight ends and third during the fantasy playoffs, weeks 14 through 16. So I really see him as a top, top guy. And that's the only reason why I didn't put number two up into number one is based on schedule. It's kind of one of those things where I don't really focus on schedule a lot, but when you have a tie and one thing or another is going to determine, that could be the factor in the in the long run. Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, uh, undeniable how talented this guy is. I hate to waste a bench space for a backup tight end, uh, but he's the one guy, Rob Gronkowski, if you draft, you may want to consider drafting a backup tight end or have insurance policy there. And uh, I think we want to get to the number two guy. Uh, for my term, number two guy, I don't know where you guys have in your rankings, but my number two guy is Travis Kelsey. I know you like this guy quite a bit. I want you to start off talking about Travis Kelsey and your take on him, Christian. All right, yeah, I love Travis Kelsey. Um, has uh, Hands down, I think he's the best. He's the PPR guy. I believe last year he had in the 80 catches range. He had a very fantastic season. Um, if you're in a PPR league, I would definitely take him over Gronkowski because he not only gets the boost for health, but he also gets the boost for all those targets. Um, and we're going to see that continue. Sometimes when you see a transition in that offense, if it's a new coach or a new quarterback, like in this year's situation, it makes you nervous as to whether or not a guy is going to continue to get the production and get the targets and the time that he needs. With Travis Kelsey, that's not a concern. Uh, he's a big body tight end. He makes good catches. He's a safe option. And a young quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, he's going to love throwing to him as like a nice little safety blanket all the time. So I don't think that's a concern for me at all. I believe last year had eight touchdowns tied with Gronkowski, tied Zach Ertz. That was kind of a uh, right where everybody was at last year. I think he can continue that production. What do you guys think, though? Um, Travis Kelsey is the only other guy that I might have considered moving into number one. Um, last year, he actually led the league in tight ends for deep catches, you know, catches over 20 yards. A um, little bit inconsistent down the stretch, and I think part of that had to do with the Andy Reid. He came out, like we said before, um, he said that he switched up the game plan a little bit. They had Kareem Hunt rushing the ball quite a bit during the beginning of the year. Then towards the middle of the season when Hunt had that stretch of not scoring any touchdowns, they kind of went away from the run. You know, the pass game did really well. He had some great games there. And then towards the end, they realized what they needed to do and get the ball back in Hunt's hands. So a little bit of inconsistency from Kelsey, but like you said, still with 80 catches, 8 touchdowns, he's going to get the ball a lot from Mahomes, and I... In PPR especially, um, he, I might even take him number one over Gronk, but um, that's the only other guy I would consider as number one this year. Yeah, you know, I think uh, you could definitely argue they could put him number one. I like Gronk number one, but uh, Kelsey number one, really, honestly, either one of those guys are going to be great. Uh, this is a guy that's back-to-back -back years, had 1,000 yards. He saw a rise in red zone targets last year. If you look early in his career, he didn't see a lot of uh, touchdowns. Last year, he had a career best eight. I think he could even improve on that this year. Last year, he had 117 targets. 31 came in the red zone. That's 26%. And that left him actually 12th on the list of red zone targets for tight ends and wide receivers. I think that's a good trend. If you want to know how valuable he is to his offense, we were actually watching, Christian, we are talking about that. We watched the Tennessee Kansas City playoff game and in the first half I think they scored 21 points when Kelsey was there he gets a concussion he doesn't come back the second half and that offense falls apart without him he's such a key part of that offense um like you said every year since he's been in the league he's improved uh, his uh, catches last year he did dip down his previous years but he also missed one game they sat him week 16 or the final week 17 I say their 16th game he sat out because of the playoffs uh, we can assume that if he had played that game, he probably gets two or three catches, and he continues to improve his catch totals there. So uh, there's nothing about this guy that's not uh, that, that you can't like at this point. Once again, he's solid. Yeah, um, you know, that's the one thing that I look at, though. The only thing to remember is that he's not as big of a touchdown guy as Rob Gronkowski. Last year, he had eight touchdowns. For Travis Kelsey, that's been very good throughout his career. I don't know if he's ever had more than that. But Rob Gronkowski 
averages 12 per 16 games. If you account for the fact that he only plays 11.7 games per season, if you were to play an 11 and a half game season, Gronk would still have eight touchdowns. So it's not like that gamble means you're going to possibly get less than Kelsey. In fact, that's a gamble as to am I getting the same or am I getting more? For me, I guess the reason that that concerns me is that those games he's missing might be during playoff time when you're making a run to win your league. And so that is it for me. Also, Gronk does sneak up further. He's drafted higher. I, you know, hopefully uh, he's going early third round. I've even seen him go in the second round, but hopefully maybe at the end of the third round or the beginning of the fourth, you could get one of these top three guys. But um, what about Zach Ertz now? I really yeah, I was going to one more comment on Kelsey. Well, okay, there, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, not only is Gronkowski an injury prone, but the opposite is Travis Kelsey. In his career, he's missed one game, and that one game was last year, the final week of the season. He wasn't injured. They just sat him out because they uh, locked up their position in the postseason. So he's very durable. But that's yeah. all I was going to say. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. So uh, now we'll talk about Zach Ertz. I really like Zach Ertz. In fact, um, I think that people very much underestimate him. We liked him going into last season, and uh, I think he really proved us right. He's got a great quarterback with Carson Wentz, who was on pace for like 41 touchdowns before getting hurt. Um, and I think a lot of people think, well, that defense is really good. They've got good receivers. They've got good running backs like Corey Clement. They've got Aguilar. They've got Jeffrey. You know, how can Zach Ertz have a good season with all those weapons? Well, last year, despite all those weapons, he actually led the team in receptions with 74 receptions. Like, he is the man there. And so I think that a lot of people are like, well, maybe he's not quite up in that tier, not quite up with these other guys. And I certainly think he's a little bit worse than them, but I do like him as an option. Um, I project and expect him to get, you know, at least 800 yards, at least 70 catches. He has the last three seasons in a row, so that's a very safe range for him. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, Good. definitely. Uh, the last three seasons, actually, uh, we, we did a video of Zach Ertz. He averaged about 76 catches, 824 yards, between six and seven touchdowns. Um, the only negatives I would knock on Zach Ertz is he hasn't ever reached over those plateaus, and we're talking about Kelsey getting 80 catches, you know, Gronk getting 1,000 yards a season, both of those guys. Um, he's never had more than eight touchdowns, which was last year. Um, and he, they lost Frank Reich. They lost DiFilippo. So realistically, the, the two guys that really love to run to the t throw to the tight end, run the tight end sets, are the guys that are going to be gone right now. So if Doug Peterson keeps and sticks with the plan that they had last year in place, um, I could see him having the same type of season. But if he wants to take that leap forward and move into number one or number two, he's going to have to increase his numbers. And um, there are a lot of targets there. You know, Alshon Jeffrey didn't get um, started off very quickly. He was dealing with a shoulder injury. Aguilar was kind of, you know, played his role. But, um, yeah, Zach Ertz is kind of in no man's land in my, as far as I'm concerned. He's definitely in that top tier of guys you could just set it and forget it. But at the same time, any draft that you're looking at, he's pretty much going number three. So it's like there's kind of a tier one, two, and then there's a Zach Ertz tier by himself. He's kind of just stuck number three so hopefully he makes the leap forward this year but he's definitely one of those guaranteed guys that you're going to get some production from yeah you know i like zach Ertz. uh for me he's a tier one guy he's right there on that edge i certainly don't like him as well as i like kelsey and gronkowski but i think he's a guy that you can trust if he's healthy and he plays he's going to put up numbers like you say he's averaged over 100 yards uh per season last three years 76 catches and those numbers are good especially when you consider the fact that he's only averaged 14 games per season if you play the 16 games then you're, you're looking at over 900 yards and uh, over 80 catches in four consecutive seasons, he's increased his per-game yardage averages every year. So uh, I think this is the fifth consecutive year. I believe that he's going to improve on that. In fact, if uh, he stays healthy, I wouldn't be all that surprised if he approaches close to 1,000 yards. Now, he had a career-high eight TDs last year, and all those came during a 10-game stretch. Um, so uh, why didn't he have better numbers? Well, I think, one, he had some injuries last year, and then, of course, Carson Wentz going down, that hurt his numbers. So uh, if he can stay healthy and Carson Wentz stays healthy, uh, you know, it's not a uh, it wouldn't take very much for this guy to break 1,000 yards, uh, 80 catches, and, and get 10 touchdowns, honestly. I think he's got that ability. But safely, uh, he's got a nice, safe floor there for you. So for me, because of that floor being safe, um, I put him up into Tier 1. All right, I like that. So I got one more question for you guys about these Tier 1 tight ends. And that's the question. We talk about the major drop-off at the tight end position in talent and fantasy points. And um, essentially, if you don't get one of these top guys – you're really settling for not a fantastic option, maybe Evan Ingram, although some people, I've heard a lot of people arguing about that lately, so maybe you don't like Evan Ingram and those are the only three guys that you do like. Do you take a tight end in the third round or is that too early for you? Because I know some people who are like, well, I want a top tight end, but a third round pick on a tight end is too early for me. Personally, I'm fine with it if I've already gotten my running back squared away in the first two rounds, but what do you guys think? 
If you know if uh, if I'm in a league where you have started tight end, if I can't get one of those top three, then I'm probably gonna wait, honestly. And uh, there's a guy that actually got my eye out there. We'll talk about that a little bit in a video. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna take a, a tight end uh, rounds uh, four, five, and six. I'm just simply not gonna do that. If I don't lock in one of those top guys, I'm just gonna wait. Um, quite honestly. Yeah, tight end for me is one of those quarterback situations where you know if you don't get one of those top, it's so it's so deep. Realistically, there's so many good points. There's so many so much value towards. I say there's about you know, these top three tier guys, and then there's another group of guys. After that, uh, I'm just going to stream my tight end. You know, I'll wait until the ninth, 10th, 11th round to get a tight end, and I'm probably not going to get one of these three guys simply by the fact that people are drafting them in the second, third, fourth round. And by, at that point, I'm still looking for wide receivers. I'm still looking for running backs that are going to be guarantees, whereas, um, you know, I can grab a tight end off the waiver wire, and they can pick me up 12 points every single week in standard scoring. I did it last year. Actually, um, I'm not going to give credit to him, but there's a guy I listen to on Sirius Radio that he every Friday he put out tight end to pick up that he guaranteed would score a touchdown. And 11 out of 13 weeks, he scored a touchdown for me last season. So um, I just I streamed my tight end in one of my leagues only, and it just seemed to work out. All right. Well, there it is, guys. So that's just wanted to bring that up on whether or not we're actually going to do that. I'm just kind of curious because it's something you have to think about in your league, and it has a big impact on your roster. But uh, let's move on now to Tier 2. All right, guys, so let's talk about Tier 2. Now things start to get a little bit more gray. There's a little bit more opinion and shifting. Who do you guys have in your Tier 2 for your tight ends? And then we can talk about the players individually. Yeah, I've got six guys in my Tier 2. Um, I've got Evan Ingram, Greg Golis, and Delan Delaney Walker, Jordan Reed, Jimmy Graham, and Kyle Rudolph are the guys that I have in my Tier 2. Um, out of those guys, um, you're basically looking, what, 4 through 9 in, as your tight ends. Um, the only guy that I might... Actually, you know, I'll keep him there. Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham's probably at the low end of that group. Um, just simply by the fact of what's going on in Green Bay. Um, Aaron Rodgers had only five targets out of his 32 red zone targets last year, went to the tight end. Um, historically, the tight end in Green Bay has not really had a great, great season. Um, so basically, he needs to prove it to me first. He's getting a little bit older. You know, there's like we've talked about in other videos, there's reasons why. These other teams have let him go. You know, the Saints traded him to Seattle. Seattle let him go to Green Bay. So there's got to be something there. Um, so Jimmy Graham is the only guy that I may or may not put in this group. Um, but the rest of those guys I feel very comfortable having in my tier two. Yeah, that's one with Jimmy Graham where that might be a bit high. I feel like he's got a very low ceiling. He's a good tight end, so he's got a high floor. I mean, you got to think he's going to have some level of production, but simply in an offense that just doesn't use its tight ends. I don't know if that's Aaron Rodgers. I don't know if that's Mike McCarthy. The facts are the facts. Martellius Bunnett and Jared Cook were the last two tight ends that Aaron Rodgers have had. They barely combined for over 500 yards, and they combined for only one touchdown in two seasons. I mean, the numbers just aren't looking great for him with those weapons there. Devontae Adams, Randall Cobb, Ty Montgomery. Jamal Williams out of the backfield, but Aaron Jones running it when he comes off of his suspension. There's a lot of guys there, so I'm not so sure that I'm confident in him. Tier 2 might even for me be a little bit high, but it's also tough because there's not much talent at the tight end position once we leave those top guys. And so, you know, who really cares, I guess, too much. Uh, yeah. I don't disagree with where you have them. No, I, I mean, I, there's, there's only a couple of guys that I – would even consider maybe bumping up a little bit, but realistically, I'm I'm kind of taking a risk on those guys because they're not even that proven um, as NFL tight ends, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. So I think as far as consistency, as far as a career goes, Jimmy Graham is probably a better tight end than these guys as it sits. But you know, like I said, he just needs to prove it with with Aaron Rodgers, and I feel fine keeping him at a, right around the nine range, which is at the back end of this tier. Yeah, I think he's a guy who's got. Uh... Uh, a little bit higher value in standard leagues, a little bit lower in uh, PPR leagues. Standard leagues, you look, he's had four seasons where he's had double-digit touchdowns. You know, I think the conventional wisdom is, well, now he's going to have this great quarterback, which is true. I think Aaron Rodgers is a great quarterback, probably one of the greatest that's ever played the game. But let's not forget that he played for Drew Brees, which also is a great quarterback, and he had Russell Wilson. So uh, really, to me, that's not a whole lot of a difference there, other than the fact that he's going to an offense that, like you had stated, and we've said in many of our videos, they just, uh, tight ends don't thrive there in Green Bay for whatever reason. So. You know, they say you learn something every day. What I just learned today was, man, Jimmy Graham is spoiled with quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. yes. I want to see him go play with the worst quarterback. Like, let's give him Andy Dalton for a season <laughs> and see what happens. But uh, I'm curious to see what you have to say, Rob, about Greg Olson. Greg Olson, okay. So I'll talk about Greg Olson. He's my number five tight end right now. I've got him actually uh, 
uh, behind Evan Ingram. He's my number four guy, Evan Ingram. But Greg Olson, number five. Uh, he's not young anymore, as we know. And I think that lack of youth could be part of the reason why he struggled to recover from an injury last year. He hurt his foot. They said he'd come back early. came back a little bit prematurely. Uh, he wasn't quite ready yet, so he had to, they had to hold him out a few games. Um, and make no mistake, he's still going to get a lot of targets this year and receptions, although being older, I think that his days of having 1,000 receiving yards might be done. And he's never been a big t TD guy. If you look at his entire career, uh, he's only averaging five per season, and he's never broke double-digit touchdowns. So I think that's, uh, in fact, his high watermark of touchdowns is eight. And so I think when I look at Greg Olson, I think that he's a guy that has a very safe floor, but that ceiling's not as high as it once was because of his age. I think his value is higher in PPR leagues, but maybe lower in standards. I've got him as my fifth tight end. All right, I like that. I completely agree with it right there. I wasn't 100% sure what you were going to say, but I think you about summed it up. Uh, he's, he's not a fantastic tight end as far as he's old, and I don't think he's going to be the tight end that we've seen in the past. I don't think he's going to have 1,000 yards, but there are so few weapons there. you got to imagine he's going to get the ball from Cam Newton. I mean, Cam's got to throw it somewhere. Absolutely, and that's exactly where I have Greg Olson as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's consistency. You know, uh, like I stated in another video, that – um, there's only a seven or eight teams in the league that have the same offensive coordinator, the same tight end, and the same quarterback. Now, unfortunately, Carolina's not one of them. They brought in North Turner this year, but North, North Turner's old, and he's kind of old school. And if you look at the teams he's been with before, he's been with uh, Kyle Rudolph and the Vikings when he had his best season with the Vikings, and he was with Antonio Gates for a long time, and we all know how great his career was. So I feel like North Turner in his offense, he's going to end up going to the tight end. You know, Cam Newton and Greg Olson have quite a relationship. So uh, I can see him being a little bit higher in PPR leagues, but realistically, I don't know if he's going to go much higher than fifth, and that's kind of where I have him sitting right now too, so I like five for him. Um, now, you mentioned Evan Ingram. You have him at four. Unfortunately, I have him a little bit lower, uh, but still in the same tier, so it's not going to be much of a difference, but um, do you, what are you guys' thoughts on Evan Ingram for the season? Okay, so that's interesting. Um, I'm interested to get your perspective on that. Here's why I have him at four. I assume you agree with me. Uh, Evan Ingram led all tight ends, all rookie tight ends last year with 64 catches on 115 targets, 722 yards, and six touchdowns. Those numbers are really good. In fact, he set a rookie tight end record for targets with 115. The previous record was just 77. He just shattered that. Um, he was so productive last year. I think a lot of people who don't follow football that closely. Thought that was a very good season, good rookie guy. He's going to develop. Now, that was a great rookie season. Only three rookie tight ends have ever passed 500 yards and five touchdowns in the rookie year. Um, Evan Ingram was one. The other two were Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski. Now, we never really saw what happened to Aaron Hernandez's career, but, man, Gronkowski has been unbelievably productive. Like we've said, hands down the most talented guy on this list. So I think that's a really good area for him to be in. I guess my question for you, Ryan, then is why should he be lower? Um, I actually, you know, like I said, he's still in the same tier for me. He's still one of those tops. He's my number seven right now. And the only thing I'm looking at is change in offense. They have a new offensive coordinator. They have a new head coach. And realistically, Pat Shermer is going to be the one running that offense because Mike Shula is just kind of there to be there. Um, but it's going to be the targets. You look at Saquon Barkley. They brought him in. We had talked about him being the most complete running back coming out of the draft. He's had the most receptions last year of any running back in the college football. And then you're getting Odell Beckham Jr. back for 16 games, assuming injuries. You know, um, Sterling Shepard missed a couple games last year. He had some injury issues. So all three of their main target weapons are going to be there. And I feel like Evan Ingram's just not going to have a big enough share of the pie this year to be able to reproduce what he did last year. Um, so I just I feel like I, I, I'm a little bit lower on him, but not by much. He's still in that top group for me. I'm still going to draft him. He's going to be one of my one of my guys that uh, I'll feel comfortable with if I get him right around seven. But after that, I, like I said earlier, I, I'm probably just pretty much just streaming my tight ends for the year. So Evan Ingram, uh, I like this guy. I got, uh, I guess you call him man crush on this guy. I, do. I think <laughs> that he's going to be a, a perennial all-pro tight end. But a lot of people were surprised last year how well he did. And if you were surprised, it's because you didn't follow the preseason news about him. So I want to share a quote. A lot of people have heard Mark Bavara. He was a uh, tight end, great tight end for the Giants for many, many years. Here's what he said about Evan Ingram last year before the season started, right? Let's not forget, too, that he was a first-round pick. So he said, uh, he's unbelievable. Um, I don't know what he's going to look like in pads and playing football, but he can move, he can run, he can catch. He's impressive. And he went out and had a great year, of course. Um, now, if you look at this guy, he's athletic, he's fast, he's got good hands, he's only 24 years old. He's actually a little bit smaller than your typical tight end. In fact, if you look at his skill set, his skill set closer resembles a wide receiver, which in fantasy is actually a good thing. 
Uh, it just means that he'll probably have increased numbers, maybe won't be as effective in blocking, but so what? What do we care in fantasy, right? Um, no, I know the argument, and I agree with you, by the way, Ryan, that I think a lot of his stats last year what were skewed. His numbers were skewed because it was volume-based. They had a lot of injuries, so they had to force feed him the ball quite a bit in games they were behind on, and they struggled. But I think that that's going to be offset by something else. So you're right, um, he's not going to be the only guy they're going to look towards. A lot of people are healthy there. But I think what's going to happen there is that offense was going to, it's going to improve. It's going to increase productivity. And that improved offense is going to have longer sustained drives, leading to more targets and more yards and more points for their offense overall. So I think there's going to be a balance on that. Yeah, he won't be the only guy there now that they're going to force feed, but that offense will be a lot more productive. Last year, they, they struggled moving the ball. They struggled scoring points. And then another thing that I think will help this year is now that Barkley and Odell Beckham there. Last year, he saw a lot of double teams. Uh, this year, he's not going to see that. He'll be in single coverage. So I think that'll be a little bit of a wash there. Like I said, I like this guy. I think he's got a lot of talent. Um, does he become an all-pro this year? Does he break 1,000 yards? I don't know. I don't think I, I'm not quite ready to say he's going to do that. I would agree with you, Ryan. There's a lot of weapons, a lot of moes to feed there. But I could see him uh, breaking 900 yards. Uh, I could see, you know, uh, 60 catches, 900 yards, and six or seven TDs, which, you know, is really good tight end numbers. So right at that level one. Yeah, especially when you look at the fact that tight ends, we already talked about Travis Kelsey and Zach Ertz. Those guys didn't come into the league as good as they are now. The tight end position takes a long time to develop. Like, see the running back position nowadays. Guys can come in in one season. Guys like Ezekiel Elliott, boom, first year they dominate. Kamara's done it. Uh, Kareem Hunt has done it. It happens at running back. But at tight end, we really don't see that happen as much, especially the last five seasons. And so I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Evan Ingram get a little bit better, get more used to the offense, get more used to the blocking schemes and managing everything that he needs to do. Um, yeah, his targets may take a hit, but I like what you said. Hopefully he won't see too many double teams. Hopefully he'll be a little bit better than he was last year. Hey, he made a comment. He said right now that the game has slowed down for him. Uh, that's interesting. You hear players say it a lot in their second year where it just they get in the league and it's so fast compared to college, and now he feels like he's made an adjustment, which if last year it seemed fast from it slowed down, I'm, I'm interested to see what that looks like. But you were going to say something, Ryan? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, I've talked a lot about the, the strength of schedule, and, you know, the overall strength of schedule for the tight ends in the New York Giants is 29th, but um, he could give you fits with some of the teams that they're going to be playing against in the regular season. But actually down the stretch, weeks 14 through 16, he has the second best uh, – schedule so he could pick up his production and might be a guy that you want to trade for if somebody's getting a little frustrated with him and he doesn't show the production right away yeah totally unrelated to this one thing we didn't say at the front of the video but what we're throwing out there for you guys if you want to play in a league with us and you're interested uh we're looking at possibly putting together a league with uh, you guys out there uh if you're interested in the comments say i'm interested in playing a league with you guys we'll we'll get back to you information on that so um all right well let's uh move on we kind of taking a while on this uh, tier here. Let's uh, talk about the next few guys in this. I believe Delaney Walker is probably the next one that you have, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I got Delaney Walker at number six. He's a guy that, uh, he's a quality tight end. He's not great. I think it's important to remember that even his best years weren't great per se. Per se. Uh, he did have one season that he had broke over 1,000 yards, but the last four years he's averaged 896 yards and 74 catches. He's not young anymore. Um, he's only averaged three TDs per season during his career, which is pretty low. Uh, he's a guy that reminds me an awful lot of Greg Olson, who's got a, a safe floor, uh, but a lower ceiling because of his age. Um, what do I expect from him? I, I look at Delaney Walker this year. I expect somewhere around 850 yards, 65 catches, maybe five to six TDs. Uh, once again, a very safe floor, but not a very high ceiling because of his age and some other factors there. I agree with that. That's a pretty fair assessment. Um, I actually look for Mario to have a, a pretty big bounce back season this year. You know, the first two years he played, um, Statistically, one of these websites I was with uh, broke down the percentage of targets versus touchdown passes, and the league average last year was 4.5. So on 4.5% of all attempts was a touchdown pass. Now, for the first two seasons Mariota was in the league, he threw on an average of 5.5% of his passes. Last year, he was down to 29 so I look at that as being the outlier. He had a down season last year, and I think he's going to have a bounce back. And one of the guys he always looks to is Delaney Walker. They have some new wide receivers there. You know, Rashad Matthews is pretty consistent. You can get him in the 15th, 16th round of your draft, depending on how late it goes. Um, Corey Davis is getting some hype, but one of the consistencies that he's always had is Delaney Walker. And this guy, he'll get some deep passes too. You know, I think he had seven consecutive games two seasons ago with a 20-yard catch. So um, he's definitely a guy that I'd, I'd put up there, and, you know, you can, you can kind of uh, – rely on him week to week all right so who do you guys have next on the list of tight ends because okay. i imagine you yeah. guys have different guys we do who do you got next uh, Ryan? well actually the one guy that i have in place of evan ingram was kyle rudolph um with rudolph 
He's we've talked about this in the past. He's kind of one of those guys. He's better off in standard than PPR. He doesn't get a lot of receptions. He gets a lot of red zone looks. Gets quite a few touchdowns. The only guy in the league to average five touchdowns or have five touchdowns or more in the last three seasons. Um, he's only behind Rob Gronkowski for total touchdowns over the last three seasons. And the Minnesota offense now bringing in Kirk Cousins. Um, in the entire time that Cousins was in Washington, he targeted the tight end 24.4% of the time. Now, I know we talked about it before. That could be part of the offensive scheme. But I think that's just something that Cousins likes to do. He targets his, his um, tight end. And Rudolph has been pretty consistent. You know, last year he was eighth for PPR in tight end scoring. And the year before that, he was second overall in PPR scoring for tight end. So he's he's one of those guys that really can uh, produce. And he's, I don't really, it's not a, a flashy name, but it's one of those names that if you get him on your team, he's going to be consistent for you. So I I have him up around number four, possibly number five. He, I flip-flop between him and Greg Olson, but um, definitely within this tier two range. Okay, so it's funny. Let's say, we'll talk about Kyle Rudolph then since you brought his name up. I got Kyle Rudolph number nine, and uh, what you said is very interesting because what I've got here in my notes is what you see is what you get with Kyle Rudolph. Uh, you know, and I think that you, he's a steady producer. I think he's got another guy at the high floor but a lower ceiling. Um, he's a guy who's never been a big yardage guy. He only has averaged 450 receiving yards per season. Now, he did have a high in 2016 of 814. That was the year that uh, Sam Bradford... Uh, broke the completion percentage record that year. The offensive line was brutal for Minnesota. They had to dump the ball off a lot, so he looked at his tight ends quite a bit. Um, other than that year, he's only averaging 39.8 catches per season, although he is uh, he does a lot better in standard leagues because he does see the end zone. Um, he's averaged over seven touchdowns per season the last three years. And you wonder with the new offensive coordinator, that could help the offensive coordinator. Uh, before, when he was on other teams, he really helped uh, Brown's tight end Barnage have a career year, and he's helped Ertz, so that might be a boost there. So, uh, like I said, uh, I think Kyle Rudolph is a very solid producer. Uh, what you see is what you get. I don't expect a big year from him, but I think you can trust he have a solid year. Where yeah. you got him? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I really like we've seen a fairly consistent Kyle Rudolph. He's not too all over the place. He doesn't have health issues and uh, I think that about sums it up. What you see is what you get. Uh, he does have a ceiling. He has a ceiling because there are two very good receivers on that team. A running back who can catch out of the backfield. In fact, there are two running backs who can run effectively and a really good defense. So you just have to wonder how much is, are the Minnesota Vikings going to ask Kyle Rudolph to do when they've already got those weapons and they already prefer to be a defense first team. Um, not to take away from his talent, but just to say that, hey, he's probably more of a middle-of-the-line tight end, more of a 8, 9, 10 range ranked tight end, and he's not going to be able to move up too high past that. Yeah, my like my rankings are pretty dynamic. I mean, I could change from today to tomorrow to the next day, and so anywhere from this uh, realistically 4 to 9 range, these guys are moving around consistently. I'm never going to be able to lock him down and say he's for sure going to be number four. He's for sure going to be number eight at the end of the season. But he's going to be in this tier two no matter what. So that's why I really like the way that you guys broke him down into tiers. And like I said before, there's only one guy that I wouldn't put in the four to nine range, but he's very close to it. I've had him in, in the top eight before. I just keep moving him back out. And there's another guy that I would have up here. So um, Christian, do you have him in your tier two? Uh, yeah, I do. I have him at the very end of my tier two. Okay. Um but I guess I kind of agree with you. I kind of said what I said. I don't have too much to say on him. He's a pretty simple player. Just look at his numbers. That's what you get. Yeah, not too um, flashy, but he's So I believe you said that was your number seven ranked. Rob, your number seven, who is that? Um, so for me, you know, I think in fantasy, you've got to be able to take chances to win. You do. And you've got to be able to roll the dice a little bit from time to time. Now, I talk about calculated risks, obviously. And so my number seven guy, I've got this guy ranked a lot higher than most sites, but my number seven guy is Jordan Reed, and I'll tell you why a little bit. The reason why I have him so high is if I don't get one of those top three guys, uh, I'm going to wait. This guy's been falling very, very far in average draft position, and so he's been going a lot of leagues like round 11. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I like Jordan Reed simply because his potential is ceiling. Now, there are many other tight ends out there that are safer than he is, but none of them have the ability to break in the top three or four in scoring like he can if everything goes well and he stays healthier. There's a major drop-off when you look at the other levels of talent. Um, so for me, if you look at Jordan's uh, 2015 season, you're reminded just how good this guy can be. In 14 games, he gets 952 yards, 87 catches, 11 TDs. Now he's had trouble, trouble staying healthy, and he has Vernon Davis there. That hurts a little bit. But you just can't ignore how talented this guy can be. In fact, uh, here's high praise from one of his teammates. One of his teammates came out and said, Jay Reed is the best tight end in the league when he is healthy. That was right tackle Morgan Moses. 
And so uh, he went on, in fact, right now he says that uh, for the first time in a long time, he came out recently and said, uh, I didn't feel like myself last year. I was injured. I was beat up a lot. Uh, that's why I had to have surgery and I had a bone removed. I feel 100 times better right now. And so he's a guy that uh, I would do, if I don't get one of the top three to four guys, I will wait round 11 or so whenever this guy falls, and I just take him simply because of his ceiling. Um, the one thing you have to do with this guy, though, and once again, you're probably going to have to waste the best uh, a bench spot. If you draft this guy, you're going to have to handcuff him or you're going to have to pick up somebody else. So. Absolutely. That could be a nice pick. Uh, drafts don't always go your way, and sometimes you uh, wait too long, and all of a sudden all the tight ends you wanted are gone. Maybe if that happens, that's a shot you take. But um, we'll see. I like that pick. Uh, who do you guys have next after that? We've already talked about Jimmy Graham. You have him at eight, don't you? I got Jimmy Graham at eight. Uh, he's a guy that I, I totally agree with your assessment, Ryan. Um, with A's, injuries, and surgery, he's really, I, I think he's lost a step. And um, a lot of people think he's going to thrive in Green Bay because of Rodgers and that offense, but don't be fooled by the hype. In 2016, everybody's excited to see how Cook was going to do. And then last year, of course, Bennett, Christian, you had talked about that. And the same thing applies to Jimmy Graham. That They just don't tend to thrive there quite a bit. Um, he's a guy that is finding the end zone quite a bit. He's a big guy. I think he's like he's like six foot six, is he? Six foot seven. He's he's a very tall guy. Very tall guy. Yeah, so he's gonna get a lot of targets in the red zone. Um but I just uh in that offense there, I don't see this guy being tier one. I know that there's a huge hype, his average draft position and some is going in four or five. I think that's just way too low. I think people are way too excited. Uh they get that Green Bay attached to it to get Aaron Rodgers' name attached to it and people are kinda of overhyping him, so yeah, I think that's a solid assessment. But uh, Ryan, who do you have at eight? Oh, eight. Uh, I actually, he's not in this tier, so I was waiting to talk on this guy. Um, all right. So we can move on, and I'll talk about him a little bit later on. Yeah, all right. So, uh, Rob, we talked about your number nine. You already mentioned that it was Kyle Rudolph. Yeah. Um, Ryan, who do you have at nine, then? Um, I actually had Jordan Reed at nine. So, yeah, all right, we, so. we already went through that, too. Yeah, so there's one guy that's in this tier or that's not in this tier that we did talk about, and then I, I had Jimmy Graham just outside this tier in the next tier, and I, I talked on him already. So, Is there anybody in this tier that we missed that you have in tier two that uh, we haven't covered that you think is in tier two? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about him here in a minute. Uh, Trey Burton. Trey uh, Burton I have at number eight currently, and uh, I don't know if you want to talk about him now or you want to wait till the next time. Well, he's your, he's your tier two guy, so why don't you go for it for me? He's a tier three guy, but uh, go ahead and share your thoughts on him. Yeah, Trey Burton... Um, See, uh, there's a lot of hype on Trey Burton right now, and he's the one of the guys that I said that I talk on later. Um, he hasn't really proven himself a ton, but in the time he did get to play last year in Philadelphia, he had five touchdowns and only 23 catches. He's very athletic. He's going to be in Matt Nagy's offense, and if you think of Matt Nagy last year, he was with Kansas City Chiefs. He, he's one of those guys that's under Andy Reid's tutelage, and when Andy Reid coaches another coach, they seem to thrive in the NFL. So with Matt Nagy, he's going to Mitch Trubisky, and uh, the Trubisky and Trey Burton uh, connection, I feel, is going to be very, very solid this year. Um, Trubisky, I'm sorry, not Trubisky, but Nagy likes big, tall, athletic guys, which Trey Burton is. Um, he's signed a great deal, four years, $32 million, which is pretty solid for a tight end, $8 million a year on average. Um, there's a lot of weapons there, so hopefully his target share can be up there. But when I'm looking at what I said earlier, you know, these top seven, eight, nine guys, um, they're the guys I'm targeting it at some point where I can just set it and forget it and not have to worry about too much. Um, if I don't get one of these guys, I'm going to just wait and probably um, stream my tight end throughout the season. I, I wait on tight end as it is. But um, Trey Burton is the guy that I have here um, in place of um, Jimmy Graham in Tier 2. Tier two, so that's your two two guys. So do you have anybody else two two that we missed, Christian? Uh, no, I don't. I I think that we tend to well, we talk about this a lot and we compromise when we do our rankings and things. So mine are very similar to yours, especially earlier on in those first two tiers. So no, I don't have anybody else. Well, let's speak to Trey Burton real quick. We'll finish up. We'll follow up what he said about Trey Burton, and then we'll jump into our tier three slide. Uh, for me, yeah, I got Trey Burton in my tier three. And he's my 13th tight end currently. Uh, this guy's got a huge sleeper potential. I think it's undeniable. Although it's hard to call him a sleeper because everybody seems to be talking about this everybody's guy lately. Already, yeah. uh, the coaches, uh, the Bears coach, have spoke highly of this guy, and they put a lot of money at this guy. So they obviously intend to they brought him in. They intend to use this guy. Uh, the reason why I have him in tier three versus tier two is simply uh, just comes right down to um, he just got to prove it. They put a lot of money in a guy that uh, hasn't proven it yet. And so for me, it will, I look at my tier two versus my tier three. My tier two are guys that I feel a lot more comfortable and safe with. Tier three are guys. There's some potential there. There's some guys that could definitely have breakout years, but I can't uh, put that label on like he's a can't miss guy. I just don't quite feel that yet. I just need to see it. I play a little bit closer to the vest that way, and so that's why I have him there. I think that's the difference between you and I is that uh, I'm willing to go out there and take the risk. You know, I picked him up in a couple of uh, 
couple weeks last year, you know, when Zerth, or Zach Ertz was injured and he produced for me. So I think it might be a little bit of emotion, but at the same time, I'm looking at what the things that the coaches are saying, what the coaches have done in the past with the players that they work with. And um, I, like you said, you know, you played a little closer. I played a little bit riskier. So, um, you know, I, I said earlier that he hasn't proven. So I agree with that assessment that he, he needs to prove it a little bit, but at the same time, in this tier, um, I like I like getting him up there. He's top eight for me, but you know, 13s. I could definitely see him falling outside the top 12, and I could definitely see him being in the top five. So it's kind of a one of those wide range of margins for him. What do you have, Any thoughts on that, Krishan Trey? Yeah, for me, the reason I can't have him in tier two is well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, he where he was in Philadelphia to where he is now. There's such a big change. He goes from a very effective and good offense um, that is very tight end leaning. They love to use their tight ends. And okay, you're a, not going to do this, are you? You're going to talk about the Bears, and you know we're going to get a lot of grief from Bears fans. I apologize <laughs> now. I feel bad, but I don't. <clears throat> Um, again, they go from a really good offense that focuses on tight ends and has a really good quarterback to an offense that doesn't move the ball as much, isn't able to extend drives as often. I mean, you can complain all you want, and I know that people will get mad at me, but the Eagles offense was great last year with Carson Wentz, and the Bears offense is just not that good. Um, definitely a downgrade at quarterback from a guy who could have and I think should have been MVP, especially had he played the whole season, to Mitchell Trubisky, who we just know struggled last year. Um, and then finally, they don't lean on their tight ends quite as much, although maybe they will this year, but we haven't proven that they will. So that for me is three reasons that say, yeah, he's a sleeper, he's shown talent, but is that talent really going to be fostered with the proper opportunity to use his talent to the fullest extent? And that, I don't think so. So that's why he's not in my tier two, but we can talk about why we like him later on, why we think he's a good sleeper. Let's move on to our tier three. All right, guys. So uh, you two, who is your first tight end in tier three? Well, I'll go with my first tight end here. I, I got George Kittle. He's my tier three and my number 10 tight end. Uh, he had a very good rookie campaign last year, ended with 43 catches, 515 yards. Uh, the coaches loved this kid from the get-go. You heard all sorts of things coming out of camp, and they loved him so much they traded away Vance McDonald. Now, after George took over as number one tight end, uh, he did really well. You look at all of his workout metrics on player profile, and I mean, this guy excels in almost every aspect that he has got all the skills to excel in this league. And I think it's important to remember, too, that the numbers he put up were really good, and he did that with really a below-average quarterback because Jimmy Graham wasn't the quarterback for majority of that season, so the numbers he put up were with some uh, bad quarterbacks. So I think it's a huge, huge upgrade. The coaches love this guy. Um, he's trending upward right now in a lot of drafts. People are beginning to talk about him. I think George Kittle is my number 10 guy, Tier 3, but I got him right in the bubble there. He's a guy that I can easily see moving up into uh, Tier 2. Once again, I love George Kittle. Yeah, I like him too. Things that I uh, really that I want to add to that is his scouting report. Here's some things that have been said about him. He has the ability to catch the ball on all three levels. This is huge. We talk about tight ends. Sometimes they're bigger, slower guys. Uh, George Kittle's not a huge guy. He's uh, he's not quite like Evan Ingram, where Evan Ingram's very close to a wide receiver, but uh, he's definitely a bit smaller for the tight end position, a bit faster, runs great routes. They say he can catch the ball on all three levels. He's physical, especially after the catch, explosive, has reliable hands, and can catch in traffic, making tough uh, making tough catches, so I really like that. And um, He had a fairly good season last year, 515 yards, only 26 rookie tight ends have ever had over 500 receiving yards. I like his 43 catches. He was a bit low in the touchdown department, but his quarterback situation was not great until the last few games, and so I really don't blame him for his stats. In fact, the last three games, he really stepped up his production, having increased his targets, yards, and touchdowns. In fact, his last game, he had his first 100-yard game of his career. So I'd like to see what he can do with a full season that's Jimmy, with Jimmy Garoppolo as his quarterback. He could really take yeah. off. Did I say Jimmy Graham? You did. You did. I did. That's Jimmy right. Garoppolo. We let it fly. Catch, so. So. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think the only thing is, like I said before, I have Trey Burton moved up in my tier two. Jimmy Graham's my number 10 for my tier three, so he would be my next guy. But right after that, I have George Kittle. So we're right on the same page here as far as the top 10, 11 guys. Um, Kittle, was, for me... Um, like we talked about, or you talked about, he's he's got Garoppolo now. And the thing with Jimmy Garoppolo is the system he came from. I mean, um, I believe earlier you stated Aaron Hernandez and Gronkowski were two of the three best tight end rookies, and I believe that was in the same season under um, Bill Belichick with Tom Brady as their um, quarterback. And Garoppolo is coming from that same system where they go to the tight end quite a bit. You know, look at all the years with Brady and Gronk together, and Garoppolo under following under Brady is just going to be following that system. He, 
increased all of the numbers when when uh, Kittle came in and, and Garoppolo came in. They Like you said, he had his first 100-yard game towards the end of the season there. And um, I definitely think that this year he's going to be one of those guys. People are getting high on him. The hype's starting to increase. He's moving up on the boards. And um, I can see him moving into that Tier 2 range next year. But for right now, there are some questions. We need to have him prove it a little bit more. So, yeah, I have him at 11. So we're, we're right on the same same page so far. All right, so then who's your guys' next uh, next person in the line in Tier 3 then? Who do you guys have next up? Rob, that'd be your number 11, I believe. Yeah, my number 11, you're right. And, uh, you know, at this point, some of these guys, boy, they, there starts to be a fall-off quite a bit here. But uh, my number 11 guy is Jack Doyle. Um, now, if you look at Andrew Luck before he was injured last year, of course, that uh, he was gone last year, he had targeted his quarterbacks, I'm sorry, he had targeted his tight ends percentage-wise more than the other quarterback in the NFL, so he likes to use his tight ends quite a bit. Uh, Luck should be back this year. I think that bodes very well for him. And you look at uh, Doyle, he's averaged 70 catches the last two years after he took over for Kobe Fleener. Now, uh, the concerns I have for Doyle, I, I don't think he's an exciting pick, he's not a sexy pick, but I think he's a guy that's a safe pick. Um, concerns I have is Luck's health. Obviously, Andrew Luck is not playing. That's a major setback, although last year he did pretty well with Jacoby Brissett there. He did yell in terms of catches, although his yardage totals were relatively low for a guy with that many catches. Um, another concern I have there for him is they brought in Eric Ebron. Eric Ebron was a high draft, uh, a tight end who was drafted high, who uh, really didn't do too well in Detroit, but he does have the potential there, and that could decrease his targets. But I like Jack Doyle, once again, averaging 70 catches the last two years in my number 11th tight end out there. Any thoughts on Doyle, guys? Um, Doyle's actually my next guy on my list, too, number 12. But um, with Frank Wright coming in, actually, last year as the offensive coordinator for the Eagles, he ran the second most two tight end sets out of any team in the league. So they could um, see usage for Ebron and Doyle, but I have Doyle higher. Um, I just think that he's played with luck. He knows luck. And as far as when it comes to drops, Ebron is not very good when it comes to catching the ball. He actually dropped 6% of his passes last year, whereas Doyle only dropped 1.9% of his passes. So it's a, it's a little bit uh, higher for Doyle than it would be. Um, like you said, you know, the receptions are there, the targets, the, um, the, the yardage, things like that. And with Luck coming back, that's definitely an improvement. So, um, yeah, I have Doyle as my next guy on my list, but he's number 12 for me versus number 11 where you have him. What do you think about him? Christian? Yeah, that's the thing. I like when you think about this, you have to be intentional about understanding where he's at. At number 11, he is one of the worst starting tight ends, but he's still a, essentially we're projecting him to be a starter. And I think that's mostly due to volume. I can't remember how many catches you said he had last year, but he's definitely a PPR stud. Um, he actually could be higher than this. The problem is his value is really tied up in whether or not Andrew Luck is healthy, playing to his full extent. Um, if he doesn't have Andrew Luck, then he drops down my list quite a bit. So I like this spot where, you know, if you're, again, you didn't get one of the top guys, you're sitting there maybe not super happy with your tight end position, well, you want to win a championship, you got to have a good roster all around. That's the time to take a shot on a guy like Jack Doyle. But um, at 10, we have Kittle. I'd prefer to take Kittle, I guess, if I was at that sort of range and they were both available. But yeah, again, remember, this is a very low starter position. So... Uh, there's that on Jack Doyle. What do you guys think? Who do you have next? I think we're all caught up now. You guys are going to both be on your number 12 guys. Yeah, my number 12 guy. I got Austin Hooper here. Uh, I know Atlanta would love to see the next Tony Gonzalez. I'm not saying he's going to be that, but they're looking for that tight end. Obviously, we know Tony thrived for years there in Atlanta. So I look at Austin Hooper. Well, last year's targets were actually lower. Despite that, his production increased from his rookie year. Uh, he's still young at 23. Now, uh, he's a guy that um, there is concerns uh, that he was uh, inconsistent. And so this guy needs to improve in that. In fact, the coaching staff came out this week and said he needs to improve on being more consistent and productive in the offense. But uh, he's got only 23 years old. I think he's got a lot of potential. He's got a higher ceiling but a lower floor. Um, so he's more of a guy that I draft at this point for potential. Like I said, uh, if everything fell into place, if he stays healthy, he makes that next leap, uh, whatnot, uh, you know, 60 catches, 750 yards is not beyond uh, uh, the realm of possibility for this guy in six TDs. So that makes him, uh, I said, not a great tight end play, but I think a solid tight end play. I actually, yeah, um, I, I don't have Hooper up quite as high as you. I'm pretty sure I have him in the same tier as you. But um, my next guy on the list was actually um, Charles Clay. But, you know, we can talk about him later. As far as Austin Hooper goes, the the um, athleticism is undeniable. That guy, yeah, like you said, he's still only 23 years old. Matt Ryan just got another huge deal. So he's going to be on the team for quite a few quite a few more years. And I think he has kind of a bounce back year this year. And with that, you know, Julio's going to be out there. He's going to be taking away some of the 
some of the defense. You know, um, Calvin Ridley, I think, is going to take some of the defense away, and then Devontae Freeman coming out of the backfield. So Hooper's going to have one-on-one -on -one coverage with some of these linebackers. He's a, a decent pass blocker, uh, run blocker. He's going to be out there. So, um, yeah, what do you say, 60 to 70 catches is not out of the realm of possibilities for him? Is that, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, yeah, so at 12, I actually have O.J. Howard. Um, and I know that that's a bit of a not a great pick, but, and I've said it a million times, I don't like to beat a dead horse, but I'll just say it one more time really quickly. I haven't gotten a great tight end. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to want to reach in a guy with a higher ceiling. And I think that Austin Hooper's a guy with a high floor, but he has a ceiling. Uh, he's got, a, I think, a somewhat low ceiling that could hold him back. And I think O.J. Howard's a guy who has the potential to be far more productive. Um, uh, so last year, 26 catches on 432 yards and six TDs. I really like him. He's a big, tall, tight end, uh, but he's very fast, actually, for his size. And so I like that he's a very effective mismatch if you ever watch him play. That was something they really liked uh, going in when they drafted him, when the Bucks drafted him, is that he's so big and he's so quick. Uh, he's more of a vertical route running tight end, which I think is very good for his fantasy value. Uh, he was effective. He set a rookie record for tight ends. Uh, by producing a passer rating of 151.9 when targeted. Man, when he was the ball was thrown his way last year, he was doing something with it, and he was making his quarterback look good. Now, I know the Jameis Winston four-game suspension isn't great, but if you had to have a backup quarterback in the league right now throwing you the ball other than Nick Foles, wouldn't Fitzpatrick probably be the guy? Um, so I, I don't think that's terrible. And I know that people are concerned that Cameron Brate's there. Uh, but they went out and drafted O.J. Howard for a reason. Because clearly they wanted another tight end or they felt that Brate wasn't getting it done. Yeah, I do have some concerns with him. But right now at this point at number 12, I think O.J. Howard's the guy with the highest upside. And if you're going to have the worst guy, you might as well take a chance on getting somebody who's not the worst, you know? You know, I agree with your philosophy there. Uh, I don't have O.J. Howard very far from it. I got him number 14. You have a number 12. I think this guy's got a ton, a ton of talent, honestly. This is a former first-round pick, and he's very talented. He's big, physical. He's six foot six. When you watch him play, he reminds me a lot of Antonio Gates. Uh, at the end of last year, he really started to come together. Three, three of the last five games, he had over 50 yards receiving, and he had three TDs. The reason why I don't have him higher is, uh, I really, honestly, Cameron Brate. Uh, I think still in targets there. Cameron Bray is shown to be a very capable tight end. So if he wasn't there, O.J. Howard would probably be top 10 for me. And realistically, I, I don't have him much lower than that. I have him at 16. He's still in the same range for me. You know, these guys that if you're not drafting him, you're going to pick him up week to week to stream. But, um, you know, our consensus would be right where you are, Rob, then at 14. Um, you know, I, I had my thoughts on O.J. Howard earlier. You know, his um, re really what they were is there were some breakdowns of the defense. He got out one catch for 30 yards, you know, two catches for 50 yards and a touchdown. So it, it really was just big playability, and it wasn't really the target share. You know, he had his 26 catches. He had um, 16 of those in only four games. So in his 432 yards, if you combine him and Cameron Bray last year, that'd definitely be a number one tight end in the league. But unfortunately, they're not doing that. They're, they're putting them both out there. They're both playing, and we've used this term tight end by committee. I know you don't like it, but... It's kind of the way it is on that team. And unfortunately, this I'm really down on this pass offense this year. They have one of the worst defensive matchups for the whole entire season. They're 31st in the league, and they're tied for 31st in the playoffs. And then when it comes to the tight ends, they're in the bottom quarter of the league when it comes to tight end matchups. So I really i am struggling to have them anywhere near my top 13, 14. I think I have um, great slightly ahead of Howard. I think I have them right next to each other in my my rankings like 15 16 somewhere in that range but they're they're definitely streaming options and for the most part you know in a 16 league team league i probably draft both of them but in a 12 team league i i just have them slightly outside that range but i i definitely can't deny his ability i like to see Bray to you know if they were to trade Bray away and i'm not saying they're doing this we have no talk of this at all just it would be a nice fit if they trade him like Dallas could really use a tight end right now or the Chargers. Seattle. You know, Seattle. There's so many places where there'd be a good fit there. So. Yeah, I know that people are concerned about Bright. And I'm a little bit concerned about it too, but he still went out there and had six touchdowns this rookie year. Yeah. Well, I've talked about it. I've talked about it. And I've talked about it. Rookie tight ends are not productive. Only three have ever had over 500 yards and over five touchdowns. And O.J. Howard came shy of doing that. He had 432 yards and six TDs. So he was very productive. Um, and I really like that. Um, I guess my one thing that I do want to push back on you a little bit, Ryan, and it's just simply because you bring it up on a lot of players, is the match is uh, is kind of the scheduling that they have. Oh, he has a tough schedule, and I feel like we've seen in the past that 
we really can't use that as an, as an effective way of looking forward because we've seen in the years past, like um, in 20, uh, 2015, excuse me, or 2016, uh, the Los Angeles Rams, or man, excuse me, the Rams were the worst offense in the NFL as far as points per game, and the very next year they went to number one. I feel like as far as measuring all 16 of their games, it's just too unpredictable to really understand their strength of schedule. Well, that's the best part about it is it's, it has nothing to do with last year's statistics, last year's rosters, last year's anything. It's all dynamic. It's who's currently on the team, um, their, their player profiles through Pro Football Focus, which we've talked about player profiles before, and what, what they could do this year um, when they have all of the guys put together. Like this year, I actually have the Rams as my number one defense. Whereas, you know, last year, I think the Jaguars or the Vikings were probably the number one defense. But if you look at what they have currently on paper, now that'll change from week to week too. Um, currently, this is just what I have as of, you know, we're looking at coming up on August 1st, um, what I have for the defensive matchups. Let's say we get to week one and a guy like, uh, I don't know, uh, Aaron Donald doesn't end up playing for the season and Marcus Peters gets injured. Obviously, I'm going to drop the Rams down. Their, their defense isn't going to be as tough at that point. So it's all dynamic. It's going to change from week to week. But currently, as everything sits, that's kind of where everything is for me at the moment. Yeah, you know, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that simply because when a player goes to a new team, we don't know how the team's going to play. I, I look back to when I first got into football, Namdi Asamoah was like the corner in the NFL. People thought he was the guy, he was playing for the Oakland Raiders, and he was supposed to be the best cornerback. And I believe the Philadelphia Eagles threw tons and tons of money at him. And then in just a couple of years, like two years later, he was just a uh, guy. And he's super underwhelmed from them. And it was one of the worst, I guess, purchases, you could say, a team has made in many years. So I'm not so sure that I want to gamble uh, pro football focuses ability to measure how new players are going to affect their new team's ability to play. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle here because I, I, you know, I do look a little bit. Obviously, we do defensive rankings. The reason why we do this, we feel like to some degree you can anticipate the additions to the team, how that's going to affect the, the continuity of that uh, defense and how talented they're going to be. Uh, you know, the one thing I feel like I used to be, uh, obviously, when we play fantasy football, I would love nothing more to start out three and one, four and one year, but I don't get too caught up in my record the first three to four weeks because for me, I, that's about positioning my team. Mm -hmm. What I've come to believe is that the first three to four weeks, I'm just beginning to understand the trends and what's going on out there, defensive offense rankings, and I'm positioning my team. So if I start off two and two or even one and three, I don't worry about it. I've had some very, very good records and not done well in the playoffs. I've had some records where I barely made it and won uh, the whole thing. So I, I kind of really approach the beginning of the season differently than I used to. Uh, so I, I'm somewhere in the middle where I think you can look at it, but I think you have to be careful about putting too much stock into that. You're right. Um, I used to, the, the rebuilding process the NFL used to take, you know, three to five years when a team, but I think there's a lot more parity now. And what's happening is I think the rebuilding process is a lot quicker. I think teams are a lot closer, you know, as far as the ability to turn around. And like I said, the Rams were a, were a great example of that, uh, the way they turned it around from being uh, last in the NFL to first. And they're not, they're just one example, but there's actually many examples out there. And realistically, when I'm, when I'm talking about a lot of these defensive rankings is it's coming down to what's going to break the tie. If I'm looking at some guys in the 11 to 15 range for tight ends, and I'm going to pick a guy that has the third best schedule against defenses over the guy that has the 29th best schedule. So that's really what it comes down to is who, who's going to break the tie and how is that tie going to be broken for me. If I'm looking at um, next week, who do I have to pick up? Let's say I drop, I lose my tight end. I have uh, Gronkowski as my number one and he goes down with an injury. Um, I look at who, who's on the team, who they're playing against next week. I'd rather have the guy that's playing against the easiest matchup than the guy that's playing against the 31st ranked matchup. So it's really just breaking the tie for me is all it comes down to. Yeah, and I, I love matchup from week to week. That's one of the biggest things we use in season. But before we go into the season, I'm just not going to look at it because we just don't know. And that's just me. But uh, you guys can do whatever you want. I well, it'll be fun to look back at India and see how all of our rankings shook out, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's move on. We should hurry up and finish this Tier 3. We're <laughs> yeah. really holding off on this one, taking forever. Uh, who do you guys have next? Let's roll through and talk about a few more guys and finish it off. Uh, go, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, you know, I got number 13. I got Trey Burton. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. We already talked about him. I actually like the guy. I think he's got a lot of potential there. He's a sleeper. I have bumped him down, though, compared to other sites simply because I, I just need to see it. Okay, so he's number 13. I mentioned number 14, O.J. Howard. Uh, and so I think, uh, uh, where are you guys for 13 and 14? I think you might have covered some of that already. Um, the, on, the only guy I want to talk about really quick was Charles Clay. I have him up there in the top 12, 13 for my tight ends. And realistically, we've talked in the past, it's that if they get if they end up with that rookie, Josh Allen, as their quarterback, and we've talked about it before, the rookies look to the running back, they look to the tight end, they like to keep the safe and consistent, confident play. Um, I don't see him bombing the ball deep, even if Calvin Benjamin's healthy. 
being able to get down the field, or um, you know Zay Jones finds a way to avoid suspension or whatever it may be. Um, you know they signed Jeremy Curley, that was their best offseason season signing. So realistically, as far as when it comes to pass catchers, other than LaShawn McCoy, um, Charles Clay is the guy, and he's been consistent. He's been so consistent over the past few years. He missed a couple of games last year with injury, but he still ended up with like 49 catches for close to 600 yards. Um, he was a little bit down on his touchdowns compared to his previous production, but um, when it comes to especially PPR leagues, and uh, my rankings are based on PPR in this current format, um, I haven't moved up quite a bit. Um, but when it comes to standard leagues, I guess I'd move him down maybe around the 15, 16 range. But he's just so consistent over the over the course of the season. And it's one of those names. It's it's not flashy again, kind of like Kyle Rudolph. But if you look back and you see his points over week to week to week, he's just four for 50 or, you know, six for 62 and a touchdown. It's just one of those things where he's so consistent. Yeah, Charles Clay, uh, I actually have him in my tier four. And the reason why he scares me is uh, a tight end, backup tight end, O'Leary looked pretty good there. But ultimately, it's the quarterback issues. Uh, man, the idea of, uh, you know, the guys they have there, you know, they're actually talking right now that Peterman is the guy that's leading that quarterback chase. So uh, that just scares me a little bit, but I got him in tier four. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me after they tried to start Peterman last year over Tyrod Taylor. But and after his first half against the Chargers, I don't know. Uh, they brought in A.J. McCarron. They were really going after him in the offseason. Um, so that could be a thing, but whether it's Peterman, McCarron, or Josh Allen, um, yeah, I just I find consistency. He's, he's within that tier three, and it's not one of those guys I'm really looking to rely on, but um, I could see moving him down to tier four. I, I, I don't have a problem with that either. Yeah, that offense just scares me. you got a suspended and aged running back, no, uh, no really talented wide receivers there, a bad quarterback situation. I just wonder if they're going to be able to move the ball enough. But uh, yeah, that's where Charles Clay is at. You're right, he's consistent. So uh, what about you, Rob? Where's your... Uh, so I'm still my tier three, number 15. I don't know what you guys got, but for me, I got David and Joku. This comes down to a guy who's got a lot of talent. He's very athletic. In fact, uh, last year, he was the youngest player in the NFL. He's still very young. I think he'll be uh, 22 during the season. So this guy's very, very young. Um, and if you look at the first season, he made some very acrobatic catches. Uh, this guy's got a lot of athleticism, and his numbers were hurt last year. I don't blame this guy. Now, they said he's got a lot to learn. He's got to develop. He's kind of a project, but his numbers were down primarily because of Kaiser, you know, the poor quarterback play. Mm -hmm. uh, again, Tyron Taylor's a big upgrade. Uh, this former first-round pick, like I said, is full of a lot of talent. He's got a huge upside. So kind of we're getting the point now where I got number 15, where if it comes down to taking a, a veteran guy who's got a safe floor, uh, I'm outside the top 12. I'd rather take a guy like this who's got some higher ceiling and potential, roll the dice. If he doesn't work out, oh, well, what I can do then is I can just go week to week with matchup plays. Uh, but I like David and Joku. I do think he's about one season away from really coming into uh, really, you know, that ability to be an uh, all-pro um, one thing that helps there, this kind of hurts and helps. There's a lot of mouths to feed there with Duke, Landry, and Josh Gordon. We'll see how that kind of plays out with him. Uh, but the positive side of that is that he won't see any double teams. And they're actually talking about signing Des Bryant. They've gotten in contact with him. So I don't think that'd be a very good move for the Browns. Um, they do have Landry, Duke Johnson, like you said, Josh Gordon. But I agree. That's right where I have to joke with myself. So. You know, if something happens to Josh Gordon and Josh Gordon gets suspended or is unable to play for whatever reason, for me, that moves David Njoku up the list a little bit and this guy that I'm definitely more likely to take a shot on. He's so talented um, that, I, I, like you said, he maybe is a year away, but it's a trend of tight ends to continue to get better and to not just emerge onto the scene their first year. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he made some steps forward. If you're in a dynasty league, he's absolutely a player to watch. Um, uh, how many more players do you guys have in this tier? Uh, I've just got two more. I've got, uh, I go through 17. I've got Ricky Seals Jones and I got Jared Cook. Uh, Jared Cook, uh, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, I think that he's a safe pick. He's not an exciting pick, but I think he's decent there. At number 16, though, is a guy that I actually like is a sleeper play. Uh, Ricky Seals Jones, he's a second year tight end for Arizona, and I think he's a big sleeper, somebody you got to keep your eyes on. Now, two to, uh, about two weeks ago, the, the Cards coaches came on and said they finally found their pass catching tight end. He's a converted college wide receiver. Okay, um, and being that he's a former receiver, he's got all the tools necessary to be effective in terms of the offense area. He's got good hands, speed. He knows how to run routes effectively in that offense. Last year, he started on the practice squad. He was promoted to late uh, in September in the regular season. His first two games, he didn't do a whole lot. He mostly was on special teams. His third game, he had one snap on offense. He was inactive for the next four games. So basically, first eight games, he didn't do anything. He didn't really see the field. Um, after that, though, um, down the stretch there, he got 12 passes for 201 yards and three TDs. So if you look at that combination, you extrapolate that out, that's actually pretty good uh, numbers for a rookie tight end. 
And so he's a guy that's got high, I think, a, a very high ceiling. I think he's got a lot of potential there. So I like Ricky Seals Jones. I could get into some more numbers. We talked about in some other videos, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse there. But uh, I like him at number 16. And once again, number 17 is Jared Cook for me. Uh, and then when we get to uh, tier four, I'll talk about some other stuff. But. All right. Yeah, that's. Uh, I guess my only thing to say about that is he's very talented. I, I very much like him. I like the quarterback situation. Even benefits him. My only thing, and 16 is low, and I'm nitpicking here, whatever. But I just want to say it, so I'm gonna say it, I guess. But um, Ricky Seals Jones is in a difficult situation because you got uh, Larry Fitzgerald. He's a possession receiver, lots of catches, not a big down the field guy. Christian Kirk, known for doing the same thing. David Johnson, out of the backfield. Like, there are a lot of short passing options. If you're the Cardinals, you got to be concerned that, like, they don't have anyone to really spread open the field or spread open the passing game and they make guys go downfield and to really make those plays. So I wonder how big of a short uh, role playing in the short passing game he'll be able to have with all those other options there. But, again, it's 16. He's shown so much talent that at 16, I'll still like him there. I love yeah. that pick. Yeah, he's a super big one side note that I think people need to know. He did have a recent trouble with the law, and he might be looking at a short suspension, I guess. Uh, he went to use a bad team in a public place. They refused to go. He pushes his way into it. So I don't think it's going to be too serious, but he might get suspended for a game. Just something to keep in mind. Yeah, and the only uh, the other guy I would have up here is... Like I mentioned before, Cam and Brait, just a slot ahead of O.J. Howard. Uh, we've already talked about those two guys, so we don't really don't have to go into that too much. I have Seals Jones at 17, so he's still within the same tier, up to number 17 for me. So Brait and Seals Jones are the only two other guys I had there. All right, well, let's move on now. We can go to our final tier, tier four. So first of all, before we get into the names, Christian, what do you think when you're approaching tier four players? Like, where, what role do they have in your week-to-week -week lineup? <clears throat> Um, pretty much none, unless I'm desperate. <laughs> desperate. Yeah, you know, I, I obviously these are guys, some of these guys have potential. These are guys you're going to know. But when I look at these tier four guys, these are what I call the weekly matchup plays for me. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys are yeah. not going to draft and depend on any of these guys to be my starter. But there's some guys here that maybe we'll want to keep an eye on if they develop well, if they have some potential, or from week to week you might stream them. But for me, none of these guys, uh, if I get stuck with one of these guys outside the draft, I'm going to be pretty discouraged. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even when you're getting towards the end of Tier 3, you don't want to have some of those guys as your main options. And so um, that's where, again, we go back to get one of the top guys or target a sleeper, take some chances. But uh, in this Tier 4, I don't know if we have to cover all these players since quite simply you shouldn't be stuck with any of them. If you are and you're in a bad spot, and we're sorry for you. Maybe message us and ask us for league-specific advice <laughs> if that's the case. Um, what are just a few names that you want to highlight to talk about, guys? We'll just talk about a few of them that you feel are maybe more significant than the rest. Yeah, Rob, why don't you... What, who do you have at number 18? Yeah, you know, so uh, at this point, I don't even really uh, get into numbers per se because, well, like I said, this, we're talking about matchup plays at this point. So these are guys that you need to, to roll. A couple things out there. You know, I look at Austin Fair and Jenkins, uh, Jacksonville. Uh, not a great tight end in an offense that's not high-powered. He's a guy that, quite honestly, does interest me. Uh, you look at Benjamin Watson. I think he's a great guy. He's a class act. He's had some really good years, uh, but he's not young enough. I think he sits around 35 or 36 years old right now. He's an older guy, and actually it's funny that you mentioned those two names. We talked about the defensive matchups. The Jaguars have the number one and the number one in the playoffs, and the Saints have the number 32 overall. So um, honestly, I had Benjamin Watson nice and high. He's got a, a solid um, relationship with Drew Brees after his 2015, 2016, I'm sorry, 2014 and 15 seasons. But who knows what that offense is going to look like now that they're throwing so many targets to the running backs. And, you know, Michael Thomas, and they're saying that Cameron Meredith is going to be uh, surprised at the number two. So I don't know how many targets are going to be left available for Benjamin Watson, but Sperry and Jenkins, um, they got Niles Paul there too. They signed him in Jacksonville. So who, who knows which um, tight end is going to emerge. If you look at last year, one game, I think Mercedes Lewis had three touchdowns on four targets or something like that. It was kind of an anomaly. So um, it's one of those things, like you said, it's not any guy that if you, if you end up with these guys in your lineup, you're, you really need to start scratching your head as to what you did wrong. Yeah, happened last year with Mercedes Lewis. A lot of people then, he uh, was one of the top streaming tight ends the following week. We said, hey, that was just an anomaly. That's a fluke. Stay with me. People didn't listen. Right. Sure enough, I mean, uh, that's pretty much all he did all year. Uh, I got Cameron Brait in my tier four, and that's <clears> tough because I actually like the guy. I think he's shown solid production in the NFL. 
But for me, O.J. Howard's a first-round pick for a reason. He's the future tight end of that team, and so i got to drop him down. But if there were to be a season I need injury, let's say, to Howard, or if for some reason he were to get traded, and I don't foresee that happening, Braid actually has top uh, top 12 value. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now, I just hate the idea that he's number two in a target share for an offense that's questionable. Well, like like I mentioned, if you put together Braid and Howard's seasons from last year, that'd be a number one tight end. And so he definitely has a, the value. He has the talent to be a top 12 guy. It's just a matter of he's getting the targets and he's getting the field time stolen and the snaps from another tight end. So if one of those guys were to be on the field 80% of the time and another guy was injured or they got traded or something like that, I could probably see moving both of these guys up into the top 13, 12 tight ends. But unfortunately, they're splitting the time. So you got to kind of bump them both down a little bit on your rankings. Uh, The one guy that I want to mention and talk about, I guess the last player that I really care uh, that I want to uh, talk about a bit is Tyler Croft. Mm-hmm. Tyler Croft is the backup to Tyler mm-hmm. Eifer right now in Cincinnati, and we don't like a backup tight end. Like most starting tight ends aren't great options in fantasy. But if something were to happen to Tyler Eifer, and Tyler Eifert has <clears throat> been very injury prone, if he gets traded or gets injured for the season, I think that Tyler Croft is a very good option, especially week to week. Um, but maybe even if you didn't get a good one in the draft, get a good tight end in the draft, that maybe you could even. Uh, play him for a lot of weeks or the rest of the season. Um, he's a big guy, he's a end zone sort of guy, and uh, Tyler Eifert's been that way as well. I think partially it's just a product of the system, a product of Andy Dalton and that whole offense. And so I really like that role that he could play if that happens. Um, but until that happens, he's definitely a low tier four sort of guy, and that you just got to wait and see. But he's one player that he's one news, he's one event, he's one little thing away from, boom, being a great fantasy option. Well, and just a little bit of news on that is actually Tyler Eifert has uh, come out with his back problems, and he's on the pup list to start off the preseason. Now, he could be taken off at any moment. He he might not stay on for very long. He could play the first week. But um, that's why when I text you, I said switch off Croft and uh, Eifert because basically the Bengals tight end, whichever one it may be, is kind of in the same range for me right around 17 to 20, and I believe Croft had something like seven touchdowns last year, Um, and with Eifert, his production has always been there. He's been a big-time touchdown guy, but it's a matter of staying on the field. He's only been on the field about 50% of his games in the past three or four seasons, so if he stays on the field, he could be there, but there's just too many injuries. There's too much risk with with, um, Eifert, and I think Croft is definitely a solid tight end. It's probably one of the best number two tight ends, number three I'm sorry, number two tight ends in the league, you know, besides, you know, whether it's Howard or Bray, Doyle or Ebron, but when it comes to pure backup, he's probably one of the best in the league, so he slots right in and takes over Eifert's role, and it's almost seamless in that offense. Yeah, I think uh, you got to keep an eye on both of the Tylers there, Tyler Eifert, Tyler Croft. I think both of them uh, potentially could be in a great situation. You look at Tyler Eifert, you're right, he's a huge touchdown machine. Uh, he's a big physical body, six foot six. If you look at between 2015 and 2016, he averaged 0.86 touchdowns per game. Over 16 games, that turns out to be 14 touchdowns per season. But like you said, he can't stay healthy. Uh, he is starting the season on the pup list. Now, he's come out publicly and said that he has had no setbacks, that he's fine physically, but you got to wonder at this point. And so uh, uh, it's a scary situation with them both playing there, but if either one of them were to go down, uh, that suddenly would put those guys, you know, I would say probably uh, top 15 consideration. 15 is a good number. I like that right there. Yeah. All right. So are there any more players you guys want to talk about? Anything else we have to cover? Again, at this point, how much in-depth research do we really need to do? You just shouldn't be stuck with this, guys. You should have a better fantasy plan and pick better players. But Yeah, well, in our start set videos, we'll deal a lot with that. Waiver wire videos, and we'll look at injuries once the season starts. Uh, for me, there's some rookie tight ends out there, but we did a video about why rookie tight ends typically aren't guys you want to trust. It's, it's funny. This week, Coach uh, Harbaugh came out talking about Hayden Hurst. And uh, he's been injured, beat up a little bit, and uh, Harbaugh came out publicly, and that's rare for a coach to do this, but he came out publicly and basically said, rookies nowadays are soft, and they need to toughen up. That's not a good way to start your <laughs> career. So, um, uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've heard a lot about Vance McDonald. People are moving him up their list. Mike Gusecki's had some troubles in uh, OTAs and so far in training camp, but he's one of the big rookie names that we were talking about in, before in our videos. Um, one other guy that I wanted to talk about is um, the Texans. Ryan Griffin, he yeah. actually, um, whether it's him or Steven Anderson, they actually have a, a, a really solid situation there. Um, Deshaun Watson last year didn't really go to the tight end a whole lot. You know, it was uh, once Savage came back, the tight end started to pick up pace, and Fuller kind of lost his target share. Um, I believe he got injured a little bit. 
And but uh, whichever tight end that emerges there, whether it's Steven Anderson or Ryan Griffin, could be a streaming option from week to week. Um, they have a pretty solid situation. And then um, the only other thing that I was thinking was uh, the Luke Wilson situation there. Um, throughout times, especially last year, um, there were different names mm -hmm. in Detroit that had shown signs of possibly being able, you know, Ebron, like I said, he had his troubles with drops. They had uh, Daniel Fells there who had a couple of big games. So um, if Stafford eventually decides to start throwing to the tight end, Luke Wilson's a name that has, he's had some success in the past. Um, a little bit Wilson to Wilson connection there before Jimmy Graham showed up in Seattle. So Luke Wilson's just another name that I would keep an eye on um, as a streamer week to week. Yeah, there's only one way, name I want to throw out there, and then I'll be done with my notes once again. We'll have more detailed information we'll offer later on. But uh, if you're looking at a deep, deep sleeper for tight end, it's Braden <coughs> Bowman of San Diego. Not San Diego. I can't. I uh, have a hard time forgetting that now. The Chargers yeah, with their move. It's I, really tough. It's always going to be San Diego in my mind. Just But uh, anyways, look at the Chargers there with uh, Hunter Henry going down. He's a guy that they've talked big about, um, and so he's a guy that's a deep sleeper. Anybody else you want to? No, I like that as a deep sleeper pick. I don't have anyone else to talk about. Again, we're going to talk about all these names when we do our week-to-week -week videos and whether or not these guys have value, and that's when it's going to matter. Like, why are you worrying about it now? You have, we talked about our draft tips video. Um, if you're in a 12-team league with a 16 players on your roster, that's 196 players you need to know. That's a, more than any one person can memorize. Don't waste your time trying to memorize stuff about tight ends that aren't going to have any value to you at the draft, that aren't going to matter. And so we'll focus on that. We'll, you know, cross that bridge when we get to it. So uh, I guess that's it for me. What do you guys think? I think we're good. Yeah, I mean, comment, like the video, subscribe. Want to hear your thoughts on it, feedback, good or bad. Even if you disagree <clears throat> with us, want to hear, once again, what your thoughts are. We're getting excited. Football season is right around the corner. God bless and take care.